Stephen Jay Gould testified during McLean on the fossil record. His colleague Michael Roos wrote in a subsequent article, Stephen Jay Gould put us all right on the fossil record, showing the dishonest stupidity of those who think the record speaks against evolution. Ayala and Gould were nice compliments, for the first is an ardent Darwinian, and the second has led the attack on conventional Darwinism. By putting the two together, the ACLU neatly diffused a major creationist misrepresentation, namely that differences between evolutionists over mechanisms imply that evolution itself is in doubt. Both men stood strongly for one of the strongest, greatest of all ideas. Please welcome Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard University and a former president of AAAS, speaking on what's changed, what's remained the same in paleontology. I don't have any, please no pictures, I've got one flash in my eye, I'll be blind. Um, also, I don't have any audio visuals, and I, I love light, so fiat looks, as it says in Genesis 1. Uh, can we get a little more light? Thanks. But you do have props. Oh, I've got props. Yeah. <laughs> props are good. Props and notes. Speaking of props, how, how much time do Oh, oh you got that. Great. The world's best this is the world's best bumper sticker. There's one that says, honk if you love Darwin. This one says, honk if you understand punctuated equilibrium. <laughs> My friend Niles Eldridge told me that one day he was driving around. Please, I meant it. Please. <laughs> Uh, and he was driving around and somebody starts honk, honking at him and he thought it was road rage. He ex starts ducking, expects the guy to take out his pistol and finally he looks at the window and the guy's smiling and pointing at the bumper sticker, which was... <laughs> it is a little chagrinning, though. <laughs> you don't get more posture. Oh, and I never got one. It's because I don't have it on my car. It's because I don't have a car. Uh, oh, I give them out all the time. In fact, I want some. What's changed, what's remained the same in paleontology? There's a tendency when you're telling war stories many years after to either romanticize or make yourself more heroic. I, I don't think McLean was an overly heroic trial. I don't think we could possibly have lost that trial. I think it had to have taken place and it had to eventually end up. We'd, look, there are many other dangers of creationism, but we've never failed in recent times in the legal arena, and even Kansas only took a couple of years to overturn. By the way, that hasn't been said yet. You realize, although it was inevitable after the vote in the Kansas School Board, that just the day that this meeting began, apparently the Kansas School Board has reinstated evolution. It was an inevitability, but it's nice to, to know. Nonetheless, although I don't think we could have lost that trial, I, I must say I, I am very proud that I had the honor to be one of the participants because McLean was the only time in the history of this legal struggle that scientific testimony was heard in open court. You see, Darrow brought many witnesses to testify at Scopes and the judge wouldn't let them. And he's been widely reviled as some sort of yokel who didn't want to hear the evidence. But in fact, Judge Rawson's decision in Scopes was exactly correct. He was not empowered at his local level to judge constitutionality of that statute. His only job was to determine whether Scopes had taught evolution or not. He had taught and he was guilty and uh, all our side wanted was to get him convicted quickly and have the case appealed. So that was a correct decision by Judge Ralston. Nonetheless, there was no testimony heard. Indeed, it was my great privilege towards the end of his life to get to know rather well Kirtley Mather, who was one of Darrow's potential witnesses at Scopes because as a both a devout Baptist and devout evolutionist, he could have set that issue straight. So the very fact that I did have the honor of being part of that, what I hope will be the only time, because I think the issue may be judicially settled. It is by no means settled in a variety of other ways. Please note that we did not try before Judge Overton to prove evolution. That's not for a courtroom to decide. All we were trying to show is that creationism, whatever it is, is not science. And to do that, of course, one had to give some testimony as to the nature of the evidentiary base against which they were trying to combat. No, I don't think we could have lost. It was pretty clear. I, I remember it, although I wasn't there for the whole time. We had our victory party on the second day of a two-week trial. After all, there was a precedent. The Scopes era laws remained on the books till 1968 when a courageous school teacher in Arkansas Susan Epperson challenged and won in the Supreme Court. 
The McLean decision and the Louisiana decision is the Louisiana one, which had been dismissed by summary judgment, which was then appealed to the Supreme Court, which he won in 1987, was in a sense their second attempt. The Scopes laws were straight out, you can't teach evolution laws. They were overturned in Epperson in 1968. McLean and Louisiana represented the second effort. All right, we can't kick evolution out. We'll ask for equal time for our stuff. Equal time sounds good. Uh, it was my great privilege a few years ago, I was giving a talk at the University of Denver, and I was told that a woman wanted to meet me afterwards, and there was a lovely older woman who introduced herself to me, and she said, I really wanted to thank you for that lovely talk and all the work you've done. I'm Susan Epperson. And I said, Ms. Epperson, I, you got it all backwards. <laughs> it's only I who can thank you on behalf of all of us for what you did. And the nice part of the story is that her daughter was a graduate student in evolutionary biology and also introduced to me, and that just meant all the world. No, we couldn't have lost. I will tell you one story. Harold Morowitz was very ineptly cross-examined by the assistant attorney general of Arkansas, who was, I never saw someone so outclassed in my life. Sorry uh, for the deprecatory anecdote, but Bill Mayer, who was then head of the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study, may not know this, Harold, during the testimony, in which this ineptness was being exposed very well, uh, nudged me in the ribs and said, you know, Steve, saying of the Assistant Attorney General, if that man were working for me, he'd be emptying wastebaskets tomorrow. <laughs> uh, my cross-examination was even odder, in a sense, because I was cross-examined by the Attorney General, Steve Clark, who was clearly on our side. I mean, he was Clinton's liberal Attorney General. Uh, his heart was not in it. He did a competent, professional job, but he didn't push me that hard. Clearly, his heart was not in it. On the subject of Judge Overton, let me say, and again, I say this from the heart, uh, Judge Overton died of cancer a few years after the trial. He was a very young man. He was still in his 40s. He was indeed a brilliant jurist uh, for that, which became very clear, I was also sure that we could not lose. I never met Judge Overton, I never shook his hand, but when I, a year later, came down with a cancer I wasn't supposed to recover from, I heard from several people that he had heard about that, that he had inquired about my health, and uh, I was very moved by that, and the fact that he died just a few years later, I think we owe him a great deal. Um, oh, uh, just two more anecdotes, and I will get to the subject. I, I can't even attest to this, but I, just one other instance of the ineptness of the other side when they're trying to make supposedly scientific arguments. They brought all the way from England, maybe from Sri Lanka for all I know, as one of their witnesses, Chandra Wikwama Singh, the colleague of, of Hoyle, because they don't know the difference between people who are against Darwin, which they think is against evolution, and, and people who are on their side. Wikwama Singh is not on their side. He doesn't like our way of looking at evolution, but he doesn't think the Earth's 10,000 years old either. And what I heard was that uh, when he was put on the stand as a witness for their side, probably very bemused, and was asked whether uh, he thought uh, that Darwinism was a good theory, he had announced in the clipped accent of his nation that it was nonsense, nonsense. But under cross-examination, when he was asked what he thought of the doctrine that the Earth was 10,000 years old, he said, what's nonsense? <laughs> that be, okay, one final story, which just shows how contingency, this had to happen. We were going to win this at the legal level, but why it happened in Arkansas when it did. I was flying back with Niles Eldridge, and I got up to go to the back and use the John, and there was this man sitting there in coach. He looked familiar, but I couldn't quite put my finger on who he was, and he stopped me and he said, Mr. Gould, he said, who I was, he said, I want to thank you for coming on down here, and my favorite southern word, I don't know where the L disappears, I know where R's disappears in New Yorker's speech, but he said, I want to thank you for coming on down here and helping us out with this problem we've had. And I said, well, sir, I, you know, I'm delighted to have done it, but, but what's your interest in the subject? Are you a scientist? He said, oh, no, no, he laughed, I'm not a scientist, and, and I said, are you a businessman? And he said, oh, no. He said, no, I, I used to be the governor. I'd have vetoed that bill. <laughs> well, it was, it's true. It was Bill Clinton. You may remember he was, uh, he was the Wunderkind governor of Arkansas for two years. They didn't campaign hard enough, and he lost. It was only it was during that interregnum that the bill passed. He would have vetoed it. Thank goodness he lost. He never lost another election after that. <laughs> How has paleontology changed? How has it remained the same? Let me 
get to that subject by just talking a moment about my direct testimony, I basically try to do just two things. First, to argue that so-called flood geology, trying to attribute the entire fossil record, essentially the results of one event, which is the only way, no, it's flood, the only way you can fit it into there, six to 10,000 years, is entirely fallacious. The reason why they're particularly weak in that area is some of the old earth, some of the young earth creationists who are the bulwark of the, of the political enthusiasm, I disagree with Harold, although we can argue this later, that the intelligent design folks are, are more attuned for dialogue. They're just a different group of people. They're not the, the fundamentalist literalists. They're a different group who have different concerns. I don't think they're any more arguable with than others. In many ways, a little more dangerous because they sound like they have more credentials. In many ways, I think they're less dangerous because they don't have that popular base of support, the true biblical literalist fundamentalism, which at least has a local base of support in certain denominations. In any event, that's a, another issue. But the reason why they're, as some of these older, young earth creations are very good debaters. And the first rule of debate, of course, which is after all an art form about winning arguments, not finding truth, the first rule of debate is, it, it, unless you can possibly avoid it, you never give the positive content of your own beliefs, because then you're subject to attack. What you want to do is never say what you hold and just attack the others. But on the issue of paleontology, they had to come clean, because you've got to make some explanation for why there's a universal fossil record in an apparently single and unvarying sequence throughout the world. What could that mean if not time? And they have to come clean on that. So that's one of the very rare cases where they have ever made positive statements about what they do believe, where they think the fossil record came from. Now you might say, but that shows they're at least behaving scientifically because of the standard criterion, as Michael Ruth argued, the only member is not here. If the standard criterion is falsifiability, at least they're proclaiming a falsifiable hypothesis. Indeed, they are. And uh, to that extent, they made a scientific claim. But you know what? You don't only have to present falsifiable hypotheses, you have to be able to abandon them once they're proven false. <laughs> That's what they won't do, won't do. It's bungledly proven false. And the other thing I tried to do was to expose their misquotations, half quotations, semi quotations, unpunctuated equilibrium, honk, uh, as, as just inconsistent with scholarly decency in general, not to mention scientific discourse. Now, paleontology. An odd field, in a sense, because you would think, since it is the archive of the actual evidence of the history of life's transformations, that it would provide the most triumphant source of evidence for confirming evolution right from the start. And yet, immediately, you have paradox. Because if you think of the origin of species, there are two geological chapters. And most of the paleontological materials in chapter 9 now, a lot of people don't appreciate this, but the origin of species is a trilogy. That's its structure. The first four chapters, ones through four, detail the theory of natural selection. Chapters 10 through 14, the last third of the trilogy, are the demonstrate the factuality of evolution. Those were the ones in the famous letter that Huxley said he would go to the stake for. He explicitly would not for the theoretical chapter because he never really grasped natural selection. He thought Darwin had demonstrated the factuality of evolution superbly. That's the last part. In the middle section, chapters 5 through 9, is Darwin's brilliant treatment of, of objections. The fossil record is mostly, and, and problems, problems, objections, difficulties. The geological chapter on the fossil record is chapter 9. It's the last and ultimate chapter of the section on problems rather than supports. And it's called On the Imperfections of the Geological Record. Darwin's primary use of the fossil record, ironically, is to try to explain a way why it does not provide so good an evidence of insensible intermediacy in empirical sequences as one might expect. And as is well known, he made an argument, which is entirely correct, though I don't think as comprehensive as he thought, that the reason why you don't is that the fossil record is so imperfect. Citing a famous metaphor that he owed to his guru, Lyle, he said, it's extremely imperfect. It's like a book of which very few pages are preserved. And of the pages that are preserved, very few lines. Of the lines, very few words. Of the words, very few letters. And so naturally, even though you have insensible intermediacy, since you're only preserving on the average of one step in every few thousands, it's not going to appear that way. So it is the way in which an imperfect record filters a continuous sequence. And that's what most of Darwin's treatment of the fossil record consists of. Now that has led, and I want to expose it largely as an urban legend, to this 
notion, which persists to this day in popular culture, much as we try and fight it, that the lack of intermediacy, which as I would like to point out to you exists in abundance, in the fossil record is somehow a problem for evolutionary biology or paleontology in general. To make any sense of this, you really have to divide. Intermediacy is a very separate kind of problem at different levels. Let me mention three levels. First of all, there's the issue of, of truly insensible intermediacy in the transition from one species to another. Call that fine scale transition. Why don't we see, when we know that one species is the descendant of another, why don't we see fine scale graded intermediacy step by step in the fossil record? Call that level one. Level two, which is where most of the discussion exists, anatomical intermediacy in large transitions, especially when there's a major evolutionary invention or change in habit. How can you get from a reptile to a mammal if you've got to change jaw bones into ear bones? How can you get from a terrestrial mammal to a whale if you've got to go through something in between that's neither one nor the other? other and therefore can't exist, according to Gracious. So that's the key issue of anatomical intermediacy in broader transitions. And then you have the third and largest scale issue of faunal overturns. How do you explain the fact that 65 million years ago there are, is an, uh, what seems to be an event of geological momentariness, if that's the word, in which 50% of the families become extinct, and why 250 million years ago to 95% of species become extinct in what appears to be an incident. So there you have three levels, insensible intermediacy at the level of the formation of new species, secondly in anatomical transitions, third in faunal overturns. Now here's the irony, and that's why I set it up this way. Since, paleo since 1980, amazing things have happened in paleontology, it's been a very fruitful 20 years, but what they have done ironically is that for one of those levels, they've improved our understanding of how the fossil record shows evolution by filling in the gaps that have been problematical. And in the other two, they have done quite the opposite. They have given us good explanations of the appearance of rapidity that exists in the fossil record that are fully consistent with what you would expect of Darwinian takes on evolution. Uh, so let me take up number two, the question of filling in, because the record really is imperfect. And just to make a point, because I've brought a couple old books last year, Paleontology, which seems to many a stodgy profession, has just grown enormously right from its inception. I thought I'd just bring the very first two books in the Europe, ever published in the European tradition. This is Agricola, 1546. This is uh, De Natura Fossilium, very first treatise published in the West. Except fossils, fossils at that time meant anything. It's not just organisms, rocks as well, although the Natura Fossilium is mostly about what we would call organism. And this is it, you can look at it afterwards. No illustrations whatsoever. Generation later, this is the second book ever published in the Western tradition on fossils. This is Conrad Gessner, the great Swiss polymath, uh, published posthumously because he died of the plague in Zurich in 16, 1565. And you get to his treatise at the end, De Rerum Fossilium, Lapidum et Gemarum, and he tells you in his preface, this goes on for three pages, I'm making a great innovation because I'm putting illustrations for the first time. And so now we have extensive illustrations of fossils. Now that, there's a, a step right there, the, right in the first 20 years, and it has gone on ever since then. Consequently, it, it just amuses me that there is the equivalent, I don't know what else to call it, of an urban legend out there in which people seem to think there are no intermediates on this level of anatomical transitions, the second level. Urban legends are powerful. I don't know how you get rid of them. Uh, my favorite is the one that so many people believe that we use only 10% of our brain. Some people think it's 15, some people think it's 20, but everybody knows that it's, and if you think about it, it has no meaning. I mean, until we have an adequate theory of memory and brain function, what does it mean? I mean, it not only isn't true, it's not only that nobody ever claimed it, you can't even make any intelligible sense out of it. I don't even know how it started or where it started. The only sense I can make out of it is we have a very good sense that we're not doing nearly as well as we should <laughs> with what we have, which is certainly true. But to think it's scientists say that, well, the notion that there are no intermediates is also an urban legend. It's never been anything else. The fossil record is very gappy for the reason that Darwin said. But you know, one of the greatest discoveries was made in 1862, just three years after Darwin published The Origin. Here's the original publication. Richard Owen, his arch enemy in one sense, but they were not in disagreement on this issue, bought to enhance his, his opening of the British Natural History Museum as a separate institution. 
the great specimen of Archaeopteryx, the lovely intermediate between birds and reptiles, and this is the off-print from the Philosophical Transactions with its wonderful plate. Um, we'll come up and see this afterwards. There it is, published in 1862, three years after the first edition of The Origin of Species. There's a lovely story about this. You know, you can look at these old prints, you can tell who made it. It says on the left, J. Dinkle Dell at Lith. That is, Joseph Dinkle drew this and did the lithography. Wonderful story. Joseph Dinkle was the personal artist of Louis Agassiz, the last great creationist. When Agassiz came to America in 1848 to found our museum, ultimately, he wanted to bring Dinkle along, but Dinkle decided to stay in Europe. Ended up in England because he had lived in England drawing fishes for Agassiz and was still there to draw Archaeopteryx for Owen in 1862. I just think that's wonderful. But many other discoveries kept him. They're just not as well known. Trigonia, uh, a genus of clam which had been thought extinct in the Cretaceous, but Lamarck had discovered a living one in 1803. There's a problem, no tertiary trigonias. Was it a recreation? In 1865, tertiary trigonias were found in Australia. The stories go on and on and on. Even the ones that creationists say are impossible. How do you get jaw bones to ear bones? Well, not only can you, I mean, you, you can't in some logical system if that's all you can do, if you can move them out of the jaw into the ear. But the intermediate forms have been known for a long time. One of them has the name Diothrignathus. It has a double jaw joint. It's got the denary squamosal joint preserved in mammals, and it keeps the old uh, quadrate articular joint, which become the malleus and incus of the middle ear. And then you can make the transition if you have the redundancy in the intermediary form. We know that. Now, in the, what's happened in the last 20 years is just a filling in of a process that goes back to the 16th century and is highlighted by Archaeopteryx, but surely the most elegant story in the last 20 years, and I would have used it if we'd known it then, is the wonderful work of Gingrich and many colleagues in Pakistan on the evolution of whales. It's a many-told tale now. Lovely because creationists crowed about this one. Duane Gish in Evolution of the Fossils Say No, I love that title, says they are evolutionists, they think uh, whales are related to cows, but anything intermediate, that's impossible. It would be an utter failure, he writes. Ha ha ha. Well, I never understood the argument anyway, because what's a seal, though of a different lineage of the order carnivora, but some seals are really tolerable intermediates. They may not win races on land, but they can move around, and they're OK in the water. Well, we now have beautiful intermediates in the evolution of whales, including Ambulocetus, the so-called walking whale. But it's a whole sequence. It's just so elegant, and it puts the lie right to their own favorite example. Now, quickly, with respect to the other two levels, you see, it remains very rare to find insensible intermediacy in the origin of species, and, it, and the faunal overturns, if anything, seem more real. But I think in this case, what's happened since 1980 is we have finally achieved good explanations that are positive rather than special pleading. Uh, to some extent, I'm tooting my own horn, but I do think in 1980, the punctuated equilibrium debate was in its infancy. Niles and I had published first paper in 1872. There wasn't much empirical confirmation, but if you think about it, it's a problem of scaling. You know, we know how many zeros to put after the one when we mean millions in our head, but it is so hard to get it into the gut, the enormity, the immense span of geological time is just so hard to understand. And we make errors all the time because we think we get it because we know it intellectually. It's very hard to conceptualize. Look, most species form in thousands of years, we would think. I mean, average to a historical process like that. Now, if we watched it throughout our entire career, a small population of the process of speciation, nothing would happen over 40 years. Maybe we'd catch the glimmering, and that, and that would be as slow as slow could be. But 5,000 years in almost every geological circumstance is a bedding plane. It's not a hill slope. And 5,000 years of the average duration of a marine invertebrate is 5 million years is one-tenth of 1%. One so if a species evolves in 5,000 years, as a rough kind of average, you would not expect in almost any geological circumstance to see it up a hill slope. You'd expect to see it on a bedding plane. That's the level of resolution we have. There are unusual circumstances of rapid deposition where you do see it. And I, I think punctuated equilibrium does explain, by proper scaling, how a basically branching process should appear in the geological record once you recognize its level of resolution. So you see, in that case, I think you're explaining a rapidity as not an embarrassment of the record's imperfection, but as an expression of the way geological evidence should show that process as best we understand it. And then, I need hardly mention it, because at the third level of faunal overturns, 
Darwin was very worried about them, and you see again in chapter 9 and to some extent in chapter 10, he's trying to explain them away. He doesn't deny there are periods when change is faster, but he's trying to spread them out as much as he can so they can still be done by the same kinds of processes, only a little quicker. But I think what has happened in the last 20 years is we finally understood, you see, Lyle pulled a fast one. I don't mean to be overly simplistic on this, but he did try to conflate intelligibility and scientific explanation which is a methodological issue, with slow gradualistic change, which is a substantive issue. It need not be true all the time. I think we have, and, and therefore he misportrayed the catastrophists who were the empirical literalists of their day as uh, theological apologists who are trying to s advocate catastrophe as a supernaturalism that could stuff the Earth's processes into a few thousand years of biblical chronology, but Cuvier was as much a child of the Enlightenment as any of these folks. He knew the Earth was old. He was an empirical literalist. He was the guy who looked at the record and said, it looks like there are rapid transitions. I'll believe what I see. I don't want to defend that point of view. But I think we have finally in the last 20 years come to understand. We have disentangled that legacy, and we have recognized they're perfectly acceptable and testable and provable mechanisms that once in a while can produce very rapid changes, such as a bolide striking the Earth 65 million years ago and precipitating this great extinction. Uh, the Alvarez paper appeared at the end of 1980. It was just the newest thing in the world. And when we were on that stand, it was scoffed at by nearly all paleontologists, and now it's virtually a fact of nature. So I think, you know, very... That is not, a, not as a theory of mass extinction, it's a theory to explain an historical event, or to explain the trigger of an historical event. I don't mean that everything. And so, where does, I, I, I should also finally end by saying that so many other fields, of course, affirm paleontological data. I'll mention only two, because Francisco did just mention them. Cladistics, the first statement within taxonomic theory of, of, a, of a firm and logically consistent theory for the establishment of branching order. We had good ideas before, but now it's conceptually clarified. And secondly, of course, the banks of genomic data, which give us, you realize, an entirely independent set of evidence on cladogenies, which for the most, you know, the, the press emphasizes those cases where the genetic evidence gives surprisingly different results, in which cases they're usually right, but they don't emphasize that for the most part, of course, the genetic evidence is an entirely separate base confirms the, the standard tale as best seen from other sources of evidence. So I would also put it to you that given the fact that Darwin's argument is indeed true, the fossil record is extremely imperfect, as all historical archives are, Look, I suppose it was a battle of marathon, but outside of the generals, nobody knows the names of anybody who fought in that battle. That's just the nature of historical archives. Uh, given how poor they are, I think paleontology has done a pretty good job. Now, what should we do? Should we, how should we face this? Uh, I mean, to one extent, I just sometimes want to laugh at these guys. Uh, in fact, my wife, uh, very cleverly, realized, she, she realized that companies like Coca-Cola always try and take the URLs for any website that might be used deprecatorily, like so they, Coca-Cola owns Coca-Cola sucks, you know. But uh, she's got creationismsucks.com, if anybody could think of something interesting to do with that. You know. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't, I don't want it. <laughs> well, you got fight fire with fire, but but, but let me end on this point, because I didn't mean to trivialize McLean. I think we had to win in that legal forum, because thank goodness we still have a functioning First Amendment, among other provisions. But that's not the danger. That's never been the danger. And Darrow said it right in Scopes. The danger isn't the legal system where we can win. The danger is what happens on local, unstated intimidation. Look, most people are not very courageous. That's just the nature of human beings. The virtue of democracy is that it allows uncourageous people to live honorable lives. Isn't that the key to it? Look, I, I'll just end with my fable. It's the fable I always use. But this is a fable that is actualized in 100,000 classrooms every year. And this is the danger. And you can't measure it. I'm a teacher of high school biology. I, I, I know I should be teaching evolution. But look, I like this town I just moved into. I got a big mortgage on the house. My kids are happy in the local school. I don't want to move again. And I get into my biology classroom the first day, and there's little Sally in the third row. Now, I happen to know that both our parents are prominent business people in the town and creationists. So I make a little prayer to whomever I worship, and I say, you know, you made it by evolution, so I know you want me to teach it that way. But look, I think 
this year I just can't afford any more trouble, so this year I won't teach it. This year I'll call it something else. This year I'll teach it a little later. But that's the danger. That's the whole history of anti-intellectualism in America. That is our legacy. That's our danger. Let us not forget it. Thank you.